Mary Magdalene interviews Jesus on the subject of humility. Session 3 is the second part of Humility in Practice. The interview took place in Wondai, Queensland, Australia on the 30th of June 2012. Well, thank you, Dallin, for joining me for our third in the series of interviews on humility. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> um, I thought we're up to part three, which is about humility and practice. Yeah. But I thought before we start, perhaps we could just recap a little bit what we talked about in the previous interviews. Sure. So the first interview was really about what is humility and what it isn't. Mm -hmm. And I just wondered if you'd mind just giving us an overview again before we go in. Well, in terms of the loose definition I've been giving to audiences, it's, it's that complete emotional openness to every single thing that you actually experience without uh, transferring any of those emotions onto another person or being or, or, or creature or uh, <laughs> material. And so, so what that means then is that you're fully choosing to experience every single one of your own emotions. But as we've discussed, it's a lot more complicated than that um, in the sense that it also is about um, seeing things a different way. Instead of holding on to your own opinions and your own, uh, what you believe is your own truth, you're, you're wanting to discover God's truth, which means that there's going to be the potential that everything that you currently know could be wrong. And also that you may gain more knowledge, but then as you progress, you might have to even discard that knowledge as being wrong at some point in the future. And so you have to be prepared to make mistakes and have an emotional openness to the making of mistakes as well. In addition, there has to be this uh, place inside of you where you're willing to go through and experience all of your emotions no matter what everybody else around you thinks of you. And so that's a very, very difficult thing for most people. Most people are highly invested in what other people think of them. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, uh, find it very, very difficult to be humble in, in most circumstances that involve other people. Mm. Yeah. And you mentioned <laughs> within that that there's really a requirement if we're going to connect with God through humility to be open to God's truth. Is, is that... Well, right? it's really the quality of humility that makes you open to God's yeah. truth. Like, and that's why I feel humility is like the doorway into God's truth. Without, without humility, you're not going to be able to absorb God's truth very well at all unless it, it already agrees with your own truth. <laughs> yeah. And then you'll, of course, accept it. And you'll go, oh, oh, yeah, I can accept that particular truth. The, the big difficulty, as you know from your, your involvement with me over the last four <laughs> or five years, is that, is that when we talk to audiences, it's, the, it's the, the truths that are presented to them that they do not agree with that are the most difficult for them to accept. And, and this is a, also a statement of, of an audience's concept of humility. It, it's oftentimes we've spent many, many years investigating different things and coming to a conclusion, often flawed conclusions. And as a result, those flawed conclusions have now entered us as a certainty, or we believe them to be a certainty. And then somebody comes along and confronts that flawed conclusion with a combination of logic and emotional logic. And at the end of the day, we get so confronted emotionally that we start getting angry and upset and, and all of those kind of emotions start coming out, which is a proof of the lack of humility. Yeah. And if we were truly humble, we would not hold on to these concepts, these, uh, these concepts that we have about life and the universe and everything. Uh, we, would, we would be willing to grow through this process and we're willing to make mistakes and we're also willing to let go of concepts that are obviously false when proven to be false, um, rather than hold on to them for dear life and defend them, which is unfortunately, if you look at what's happened with religion on the planet, even the cause of most religious wars have been the result of somebody wanting to hold on to a flawed concept about God or about love or about the world around them and then impose that concept on another person who obviously cannot agree with that flawed concept and that's why many wars have even occurred in the name of religion. And so, so it's a lack of humility that has caused many of these things to occur on the planet. Mm. 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 Uh, 
Okay. Uh, there was a few other follow-up questions I had just mm-hmm. around that concept of humility. <coughs> um, would you say that humility involves, once we engage this process, obviously, of allowing our false beliefs to be challenged, yeah. do you think... I mean, I get from what you're saying that it's being overwhelmed. Oh, it's a, a desire or an allowance to be overwhelmed by my own emotions. Mm-hmm. But does that ultimately lead me to a willingness to be overwhelmed by God? Is yes. that a part of humility? If, if you can't allow yourself to be overwhelmed by your own emotion, then God's emotions, which are much more powerful, infinitely more powerful, in fact, than our own, Um, are going to find it very, very difficult to enter us um, while we are so resistive to feeling even our own limited emotions. So so the way God is teaching us is that God's basically saying to us, look, you need to open your heart firstly to yourself and to your own emotional experience because if you don't do that, how are you ever going to absorb one of my emotions that I have for you when, when you're not even allowing yourself to be overwhelmed by one of your own emotions that you have for anything externally. And, and so I feel quite strongly that this whole, this is why we've spent a lot of time teaching people that they need to open up emotionally because without opening up emotionally, they are staying close to their own emotions. While they stay close to their own emotions, how can they ever experience the emotion of another person entering them? And if that other person is God, you know, an infinite loving person who has an infinitely powerful set of emotions and um, how can we ever expect to to actually receive those emotions if we're already shut already shut down to our own limited set of emotions yeah. very very difficult so for the majority of people i feel you know the the people who want to really connect to god they need to understand that that this emotional openness is essential the beauty of having a longing for God's love is that it starts to open you emotionally. But if you're not humble, you'll close that down very rapidly. And, and this is why the quality of humility is an essential part. You know, it's, it's, the three, it's part of the three essential core things regarding our relationship with God. Because without humility, truth can never be absorbed. Without truth ever being absorbed we can never enter a state of love mm-hmm. and, and also can never receive God's love to the complete degree that we could. And so therefore we are limiting our own growth. So it's very counterproductive to actually not demonstrate humility. Yeah. It's far more productive to, to work on the quality of humility as one of the most important and essential qualities you can ever develop. Mm. Mm. I think I was saying to you yesterday, it seems like a good design feature that God's placed in our soul because yeah, it's beautiful, it, isn't it? it means we get the gift of knowing ourselves mm-hmm. as we come to know God, doesn't yes. it? Yes, yeah. and no, I feel that's one of the reasons why God created it that way, yeah. is that God's basically saying, look, unless you're willing to know yourself as I've created you, and unless you're willing to experience yourself as I've created you to experience yourself then um, it's, it's going to be very difficult for you and I, God's saying, for, 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 for God to actually have a relationship with you when you're, also, you're so limited in experiencing yourself even, um, let alone an infinitely more powerful being um, who wants to connect to you. Whereas uh, this way we have the ability to begin to experience ourselves and know ourselves and, and fully experience our own emotions. And as a result of fully experiencing them, that we now have the capacity to grow into also experiencing God's emotions for us. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Did you want to uh, highlight anything about what humility is not, just briefly? Well, I think that's what we're probably going to cover in our next interview, sure. isn't it? All the things that humility is not. There's so many things yes. that, um, that are misinterpreted. Uh, I suppose the biggest one that probably we need to mention at the outset though is this is that it is not a false sense of being lower than somebody else not that at all and and i feel this is one of the main misconceptions uh, that uh, that so-called holy people impose in 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 that they create a sense of fake humility and modesty that uh, does not gel with god at all because it's also not real and and so I feel that's an essential thing to give up yeah. if you really want to connect to God. So it's not like false modesty, but it is an ownership of what what is in error inside of us, isn't it? Mm-hmm. It's 
would you say it's coming to see yourself as God? Totally. It's yeah. a willingness to come to see yourself as God sees you. Because yeah. initially it's very difficult to do that um, and also very hard to do that instantly. So it's a process that you're going to go through. But, but to do that, you're going to have to see eventually that pretty much everything that you've conceived is probably wrong yeah. and <laughs> needs to be adjusted in some positive direction towards God's concept of the universe. And what I feel happens most of the time is people are so invested in holding on to what they believe is right that they are totally unwilling to conceive that actually, no, God knows everything that's right and all we are is just discovering those things. And people do not allow the discovery. Like, humility allows discovery. Mm. And the beauty of humility is it opens up your heart enough to conceive that you need to change your mind and you need to change your heart on different things. And, and therefore, you, once you have that, you are looking at the universe completely different. Instead of looking at the universe, trying to make the universe conform to your idea of it, you're looking at the universe from a position of, I want to discover everything in the universe. And not just one set of things, like the physical things or, or, or something like that, but rather everything becomes open to discovery when you're truly humble. When a person's resistive in any direction, then their discovery in that particular direction is completely closed down. So for that reason, you see people who are musicians co pl co totally closed to science. If they were truly humble, they'd be open to both things. Mm -hmm. You see scientists totally closed to art, you know, but if they were truly humble, they'd be open to both things. Uh, um, when we're humble, we're willing to investigate every area that God has created, not just the not just areas that, and there'll be favourites, but, mm. but not just one area to the resistance of all others. Um, and this is part of humility. Once you become more and more humble, you become more and more open to everything God's done, not just a few limited things that yeah. God's done. And I suppose that <coughs> opens you to how it's all connected and how it can all give to each other. And Well, that's synergy. the other beauty yeah. of having humility is you start seeing how the entire universe interblends and, and operates mm -hmm. whereas if you're not humble you, there's all these pieces that are missing all the time because you're so resistive to receiving truths about certain pieces and I see this happening a lot in the medical industry and you see it happening a lot in the economic uh, platforms that are on the planet and you see it happening a lot even in technology where people are very very limited to certain forms of investigation and as a result of that nothing can be developed mm -hmm. and nothing can be discovered and it's only when somebody's open, uh, completely open to changing their mind and being wrong, um, that, that things will change. But on the planet, as you know, there's a huge condemnation of anybody who's wrong. So, so like, like in my life, I've made very few mistakes because of the portion of my life that I've been at one with God. But before I became at one with God in the first century, I had to make mistakes in order to to learn the truth, to, to discover new things. And I had to get into this concept that it's okay for me to, to investigate something and in turn out to be wrong once I've investigated it. So I don't have a hang up about that. A lot of people have hang ups about it because they email me <laughs> condemning me about being wrong about some kind of subject that, that they feel that I was wrong about and often that I wasn't wrong about, yeah. but, uh, but there are, there's some subjects, of course, that you finish up being wrong about, and you will be through the process of investigation. And, and while you condemn another, what you're doing is you're demonstrating that you have within yourself a lack of humility to being open to making mistakes. Mm -hmm. and, and this is all a part of the, the need for the planet to become, get out of the arrogant state, which is a very self-reliant state, and into the humble state, which is very God-reliant state. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> mm -hmm. So, and from what you're saying there, it's one of the notes I wrote after our last interview was humility is giving up things on my terms or in under my control. Mm. But really, from what you're saying, any time I encounter a subject or a, a new idea that I find myself very rigid, resistive, and hard to immediately, I have a signal to say there's a lack of humility going on mm -hmm. here. If I may not agree or may not share in it, but I would be soft to this situation if 
if exactly. I was in humility. Yeah. yeah, humility is understanding of all situations. It doesn't necessarily agree with the situations, but it is emotionally understanding in the sense that it, it still feels its own emotions. It doesn't impose its own emotions back on or, or its own hardness back onto something. Mm -hmm. And so what, what I see happening a lot where two people, two different religious groups get together, they, they finish up attacking each other and yelling at each other and screaming at each other and even finish up maybe throwing things at each other and, and maybe even killing each other, yeah. which has happened historically many times. And the main reason why is because both sides lack humility. If they, if they had humility, they'd understand where the other person coming from, why they're coming from that direction. They, they might not agree with them, but they'd understand. Also, if the other person disagrees with them, they wouldn't try to impose what they feel upon the other person. Yeah. They'd say, okay, you're allowed to have your disagreement and at some point in the future you might change, you know, like, and at some point in the future I might change <laughs> yeah. and we'll have to just, if we're both sincere in working towards God, sooner or later we both will be willing to change. Mm. And the fact that we're not willing to change and we're even not willing to treat each other lovingly in this exchange means that we lack humility. Yeah. 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 Thank you. All right. Well, in the second interview, we talked. We started to talk about what is humility in practice. Yeah. And yeah. Um, if I just mention the two points we've already covered. Sure. That was that um, humility is a wholehearted desire to feel and experience all emotion, and you've touched on that again this morning. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and and it's a it's a desire, not a reluctance. <laughs> this is a very important part. Like. As most people I see, are v uh, they talk about humility and they think they're humble when they're still very reluctant to it's experience. It's a begrudging. <laughs> it's a begrudging feeling of do I have to type of feeling. And that's not humility. Once we're, once we're in a truly humble place, we desire it. We passionately want to experience all of our own emotion because we know it's the only way that we can get closer to ourselves and therefore and, and expand and also get closer to God through the process because we know that if we experience all of our own emotions, we've at least had the courage to go through a lot of our emotions and, and, and the ability to feel our own emotions, then when God gives me some of God's emotions, I'm going to be able to be mm -hmm. sensitive to it, open to it. I'm going to let myself be overwhelmed by it. I'm not going to be resisting it. I'm, going, I'm not going to be attacking it or shutting it down. I'm going to be completely open in my expression of emotion towards God and also in my ability to receive it, mm. if I desire it. If I desire it. And yeah. that's you talked about the strength of desire being, it's a desire above all other things, basically. Mm -hmm. yes. This desire to feel myself and know God would surpass desire for any other thing, basically, which was Correct. pretty radical. Yeah, yeah. and also... And I feel a, a lot of people don't appreciate the benefits of desiring the relationship with God first mm -hmm. because there are automatic benefits to yourself personally because you then know yourself as a, as a result. You finish up knowing the other half of yourself, your soulmate, and in the process. But, but um, all other things come from this relationship with God. Mm -hmm. So if, if you're completely shut down and you're not humble to your own emotional experience, you're shutting down the ability to receive all these beautiful gifts from God mm -hmm. because all of them come via the relationship. Yeah. And without the relationship being established, you have no hope of having any of those gifts given to you. And so you walk around the earth thinking that you know truth and thinking that you know how everything works, but it's all just an intellectual idea or a concept that has no meaning in your day-to-day -day life mm -hmm. and also has no change in your heart. So therefore the way you, you interact with other people is not affected. And then in addition to that, it's very, very difficult for you to, um, to understand anything beyond what your concept is. And so you finish up attacking somebody else's this and somebody else's idea of that you attack and, and you finish up having all these blocked viewpoints of everything that you could discover because you're just so shut down to experiencing any of your own fears and other emo painful emotions. Mm. And it is our soul that's the eternal thing, isn't it? Yes. Not this mind or this spirit. It's the soul that carries the wisdom ultimately, isn't yes. it? Yes, yeah. 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 And and unless we understand, and even discovering that truth requires humility <laughs> yeah. because our mind wants to desperately hold on to this intellectual concept that usually our environment has created of ourselves. 
and, and we desperately hold on to it, not wanting to give it up, only because we don't want to discover what's in our soul, what's mm. really there, what, what our true nature, true personality and all those kind of things are. And I feel that's why a lot of psychologists call it the subconscious, because it has been so suppressed over millennia that, that now the majority of people, it's only a subconscious thing that subconsciously drives them, their soul, mm. rather than something that they're consciously connected to. And the main reason why is because they don't have any humility to actually <laughs> feel what's really going on inside of themselves. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Okay, um, the second point we talked about was that we talked about God's love flowing into our heart depends on these qualities of, hu of humility. Mm -hmm. And the second quality or the humility in practice would look like a willingness to take responsibility for experience and release fully without reservation mm -hmm. all the error within myself that prevents God's love from flowing. Yes, and and in particular we focused on the point of taking responsibility. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of other people have done damage to us in the world in which we live. We, we, we can't avoid that as a truth. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. when you or I get into a state of unloving behaviour, we automatically affect another person unlovingly and so that person then receives emotional damage and other damage which is painful for them to experience and as a result of that they have pain in them that wasn't there of their own creation that they weren't um, the cause of in, inside of themselves and yet it is now in them mm -hmm. and they and we all have this kind of pain pain that's now in us that we did not personally cause, but our environment caused in some way, and yet it's now in us. And when we take personal responsibility, we understand one basic truth, and that is only we can let go of things that are now in us. Mm -hmm. Nobody else can do it for us. So all of those p lovely people who harmed us, who we don't think are they so lovely, and mm -hmm. um, those people no matter what they do, they could become perfect people and they could be absolutely repentant and sorrowful about the things they've done to us. Even then, we will still not release the hurt unless we take responsibility for what's inside of us. A person who's truly humble always takes responsibility for what's inside of them. It doesn't mean that they accept that they are the cause of it, but they do accept that they are the only person now who can release it. Yeah. They are the only person who can choose to grow from the situation, and if they they have a choice, they have a choice to grow, and uh, and release these the these unhealed emotional baggages that control their life, or they have a choice to act upon them and cause more pain to other people and themselves through that process of action. A truly humble person would never choose the second course of action, ever. Mm. Uh, a humble person always would choose the first course of action to fully embrace their own emotional experience no matter who created it, no matter who external to themselves caused their pain. Mm. Mm. And I suppose that um, practically, th this is about humility in practice, practically that means humility is a choice we have on a moment by moment basis. And it's not just going away and having a big cry, it's something I can do at every, I, I'm faced with that choice at every moment. True, but um, in addition to that, you could also say there are certain emotions that affect us being humble, you know, that, that sure. influence our, our humility as well. So, for example, if I am afraid of humiliation all the time, then I'm not going to be very humble because I'm constantly in a f fearful of somebody humiliating me when I acknowledge the truth of a situation. Mm -hmm. If I am in that constant fearful place, it's going to be very difficult for me to be humble. If I am invested in other people's opinion of me, it's going to be very difficult to be humble because sometimes I'm going to be wrong and they're going to laugh at me. Mm -hmm. And if they laugh at me then I'm, and I feel bad about that and I don't want to feel bad about that, then I'll try to prevent them from laughing at me, which means I'll try to prevent you know, being open and truthful about what is really going on inside of me and what's really going on in my relationships. And so there are certain emotions that are all about humility. In that. So my suggestion to anyone who's progressing towards God is to try and address and deal with the emotions that are about humility first. Okay. Because, because if we do not address those particular emotions, then we'll never open to truth. And, and, and emotional truth can never enter us then. Um, so, so 
I see it as humility is a state of which uh, we, can, we can get to, a, a complete state, and we don't have to be perfect to get to it. Mm -hmm. um, and, but there are so many different emotions involved in cr creating a state of humility. And those emotions include things like we've just mentioned, being humiliated as a feeling and resisting that feeling, you know, wanting the, to other people to have a good opinion of us, wanting uh, feeling nice feelings from other people all the time. You know, these will all prevent us from being in a state of humility. So practically, what would we do if we're such a person we're faced, we recognise, oh, I've got all these, these issues that prevent me just living in a state of humility. Practically, what does it mean if we work on those emotions? Well, God's law of attraction will automatically be operating in the universe around us based on our soul. So our soul will be attracting events already um, that cause our lack of humility to be triggered uh, uh, in terms of uh, or exposed. Mm -hmm. and, and in that moment, we have a choice. We have a choice to either fully experience and feel and be open to everything that we're feeling without damaging another person or the choice that most people take is they then damage the other person that created this, seemingly created this attraction that mm. we are now experiencing. If we were truly humble, we'd, we'd be saying, no, this law of attraction that God has made is a beautiful gift to me. It's a gift to me because it's showing me every area in my life that where I'm not humble. And if it's showing me these areas in my life where I'm not humble, then I have the ability to open to them and just experience the underlying emotions. And that's going to make me softer and softer and softer to everything, which will make me more humble to everything. Mm -hmm. so, so I don't really have to go out and choose them. There are certain things that I might be able to write now, the average person might be able to say right now, oh, I can list a whole list of different emotions that I, are affecting my humility. And my suggestion is to list them and to start working through them and noticing them in your life and everything. But the reality is God is always trying to connect to us and the law of attraction that God has made is, all, is there purposefully to help us address our lack of humility in our lives and to get into this really, really humble state so that God can communicate with us better and, and therefore God can give us more truth as well. Now, if, if I am completely open to this beautiful gift that God's giving me constantly, which my soul, my own soul, is creating through the law, um, then I would notice every single event that occurred in my life that, that is exposing to me that I don't have enough humility in that particular area. I'd be praying about that. I'd also be wanting to work through the underlying emotions about that. I'd want to find out about those particular things. I won't be resisting it all the time or fighting where these things are coming from. And, and instead I'll be embracing them and working my way through them so that eventually I get to the point where I, I am completely humble and, and able to absorb as much truth as possible from God. Yeah. Thank you. Mm. Okay, well, let's get on to the, the next point, yep. which is probably... So this is our points of humility in practice yes. now that we've been discussing yeah. the last yeah. time and this time. Yeah. Yep. Okay, so the next point is... Um, that God's love can only flow into my heart when I'm willing to be as I truthfully am. So humility is practically being as I truthfully am. Yes. So my question is, what does being as I truthfully am encompass? Well, firstly, it involves giving up the facade. The facade has been created uh, for uh, quite a few different reasons. You, you could say from a soul perspective, we have our real soul, our true feelings, then we have the, um, our, our next set of emotions, which are the damaged self, which is like, and, and that, that, that damaged self or that damaged soul is all of these really harsh emotions that have been imposed upon us by our environment through the different painful experiences generally that we've experienced throughout our life. And that is, you could call that our damaged self. That's not our real self yet. That's just the, the real self with a lot of emotional baggage on it, created by an environment that's a painful environment to live, it, live in. Mm -hmm. And also created too, to a large degree, by our own choices that we've made as a result of living in this harsh environment. Because the reality is we can live in a harsh environment and make no unloving choices. 
So we, we have that ability. So does that refer to what you just spoke of, uh, when we have the choice to act on the damage, mm -hmm. that's when we create more? Exactly. Or we could be humble in that moment. If we were truly humble, yeah. we would never create more damage in sure. the world in which we live, sure. if we were truly humble. Then there's the third self, if you like, which is the facade self. The facade self is the person who, who we want to believe we are. And that person generally is very much linked with the persons that our parents wanted us to be <laughs> or our environment wanted us to be. Does that make yeah. sense? And so, so the facade self has to be given up completely, completely. And if we don't give up the facade self completely, then we will never ever learn to be our real self. Mm. Now, when we give up our facade self, the facade self is saying, I've got everything under control. I know everything. I know what's going down here with our relationship and you're the person who's the blame and, you know, and all those kind of things. That's what our facade self does. Yeah. Our real self is going, no, I can feel my own damage. I can feel my own problems. I can feel how I feel in this. And it's willing to be that person in public. Mm. The facade self is usually present very much in public, but in private, generally, we're a bit more into the damaged self in private, right? What, when, if we're truly humble, we'd be willing to be this damaged individual in public. Right? We're willing to expose ourselves to the universe <laughs> completely. And, and that doesn't mean we act upon the damage, because a person who's truly humble would never act upon the damage mm. and damage another person. But it is, a, we need to actually feel what we feel and express what we feel honestly. And, and that means we wouldn't be involved in lying to people. We wouldn't be involved in helping people believe things about us that we know are not true. Mm. We wouldn't be involved in creating facades about ourselves. We wouldn't be living in a facade even where, where we've created an entire life to support our facade. We'd never do any of those things if we were truly humble because a truly humble person is just themselves, warts and all, mm. as the saying goes. So what if that person is, what if I dissolve my facade miraculously mm -hmm. and I discover... Which, which is an emotional process because there are emotional reasons why you want to hold on to facade. Yep. Sure, yep. sure. Um, and I discover I'm an angry person. Mm -hmm. And I think, well, humility is just being the real me. I'm just going to be angry with you. But that's an, that's not, that is a definite misquoting of what I've just said, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> because the reality is I d that if I was truly humble in that place, I'd go, wow, I'm a very angry person. Mm. What am I going to do about that? What, what am I going, right, where does this anger come from? Yeah. What, what's its underlying cause? What's, what's inside of me that causes it to just, me to just fly off the handle all the time? And instead of flying off the handle all the time, I would withdraw from situations where I fly off the handle and I'd try to feel instead the emotion I feel that's under the anger. So I'd let myself feel the anger but not express it to another person. But I'd go deeper and actually find out what is the underlying fear that I have that drives this addiction that causes my anger. Does that make sense? So I'd be willing to feel the addiction that's not being met. If I was truly humble, I'd be willing to go, wow, that's a big addiction I have that everybody likes me. Because mm. that's when I, when I get angry is when nobody, nobody seems to like me. So I want everybody to like me. That's a big addiction. But the reality of that ever happening is fairly low. <laughs> but but uh, not only that, even in a perfect world, I still have the addiction. It's not a very nice addiction to impose on others that they have to like you before they even know you. And so, you know, that's, a, that's an unloving expectation. And that addiction, I'd be able to go, okay, wh what is this addiction? I, so I'd feel the addiction. And, it feel, and when you feel it, it feels quite sickly inside of yourself because you feel like, wow, there's something really wrong in here, <laughs> you know, inside yeah. of myself. And then you go, what, what fear is driving this? And, and a lot of, oftentimes it's the op op opposite. Mm -hmm. so, so the fear driving it might be, for example, in this case, this fear that I'll never be loved by somebody for, for who I truly am, that I'm going to have to completely modify myself to be loved. And, and there's a lot of grief under that because, mm. because if you've got that fear, 
then usually in your childhood there's a huge amount of grief associated with the fact that you weren't loved for who you truly were mm. and that you have to go through that emotionally as well. So you would be willing to embrace that entire process if you were humble. You wouldn't be projecting it outwards. You wouldn't be using it as an excuse to rage upon somebody else or an excuse to make somebody else have the same fear as you do or an excuse for somebody else to share in your grief about it um, because all of those things would be a lack of humility. You'd be completely owning your own emotions every single moment. And so you, if you think about it, you, you would never use as an excuse that, oh, I'm an angry person, so I'm just going to be angry. Mm. You'd never say that if you were a humble person. Mm. Now, we meet many lack persons who are not humble, obviously, who have said that to us many times. They have this feeling that as soon as you talk about emotions, they have this belief system that, Oh, that means I can go and express any emotion I have without uh, any limit or whatever. And they are very wrong, yeah. right, when it comes to the quality of humility. Um, there is no humility in them at all, really, if they do that. And, uh, and so my suggestion to those, those people is go, no, be a bit more self-reflective and understand that every time you make a choice to act in harmony with your um, unloving emotions you are going to create more pain, not only just for yourself, but for other people. Now, where did all your pain come from? Mm. If it came from your environment, you're not happy about it, right? Well, how, how would you like then to have other people to create more pain for you? Wouldn't be very pleasant. So then choose to stop doing the same with other people. Have some ethics, yeah. <laughs> you know, have some yeah. emotional ethics yeah. where you stop doing things to other people that you do not want them to do to you. Yeah. Sure, yeah. sure. Thanks for answering my cheeky question. <laughs> yeah, I just see that sometimes this real self, uh, being my real self, can often be misunderstood or misused. Totally. Because yeah. if you look at the real self, the real self is purely loving. That's the self God created. Mm. Purely loving, purely connected individual with the environment around them. If they're being their damaged self, that is better than being their facade self. But in a da if you're being your damaged self, you will not be projecting your damage upon your environment if you're a humble person. Mm. So, so I see a lot of people still in their facade, really, when they go, I'm being myself and they're being angry. Well, that's your facade, actually. Yeah. That's, that's what you do to get other people and manipulate other people into exceeding or, or agreeing to your emotional addictions. Mm. That's what you do. That's your facade. If you got out of your facade and got into this damaged self, you'd never agree ethically that it's what good to have another person give you anything that you're not prepared to earn for yourself, mm. like to have for yourself. And so I would never go, I want you to love me, while at the same time going, I don't love myself. You know, th yeah. it's unrealistic and also unethical for me to demand love from you when I'm not willing to love myself. Mm. So are you saying that humility encompasses ethics? Definitely. Yeah. yeah. In fact, humility, I feel, is the pinnacle of ethics, um, and, but it's also the pinnacle of morality. Yeah. And if, if a person listens to that talk that I've done recently in Melbourne uh, about ethics and morality, once we've got that mastered, <laughs> um, you'll find that um, you know, one is to do with how we interact with other people on an equal basis. The other one is about accepting God's principles and laws, and humility involves both of those things, right. ethics and morality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's much, it's a much bigger thing, humility, isn't it, than just, you know, crying. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's a, you know, I give a definition in uh, basic presentations that, that if people can connect to that definition, they'll understand all of these other things. But... But the reality is it does encom encompass many, many things to get to a point where you're completely humble and able to experience God, you know, in a perfect manner. Um, you, you're going to have to work through many things to get to that place. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, under this, um, under the notes that you had written some years ago about this point about the willingness to be as I truthfully am. Mm -hmm. You've quoted um, the Bible. Mm -hmm. You've quoted James 1, 23 and 24. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just wondered if you would explain what this means and how it relates to humility. And I have the quotation here for you. Yeah, the reference is about a man who looks in the mirror. Yeah, it's... If you yeah. want to read it, that's fine. Oh, just for the... Yeah, for the sake of the audience. Yeah. Yeah. Um, for if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer... 
This one is like a man looking at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and off he goes and immediately forgets what sort of man he is. Mm. So what does this mean? Yeah, so true humility, we look in the mirror and you could say the mirror is God's perception of us. So when we look in this mirror, we see ourselves, blemishes and all. And, and most people, when we see, initially, when we see all the blemishes that we have, we become quite frightened because we feel that nobody will ever love us and nobody will ever care us with all these blemishes that we have and so forth. And so what we do is we have a tendency to try to ignore them and, and hope they all go away somehow <laughs> by themselves, which of course never happens. Um, instead of doing that, what, uh, what humility recommends to us is that we always remember the condition we are in at any point in time and instead of being self-attacking about the condition we just remember it we know where we're at so the man who's very angry knows he's very angry mm. the man who's very sad knows he's very sad the woman who feels sexually ashamed knows she feels sexually ashamed she doesn't go away and uh, walk away from that mirror in, in her relationship with god and go, oh, no, that's not true. I can just ignore that. Or or that she doesn't go away or he doesn't go away going, oh, you know, yeah, that is true. I've got that problem, but I've got to get on with day-to-day life. That They see these issues and problems as the most important thing they must address mm. in their entire life because, of course, it's the thing that's limiting their connection with God and their connection with self. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so, of course, it's got to be the most important thing that they address in their entire life. And, and they have this attitude that they're not going to walk away from this mirror when God puts the reflector up and, and through the law of attraction and, and your soul automatically has an exposed condition. And they, they, then do, they don't go, oh, oh okay, and, and then walk away and forget that entire thing. They go, wow, this is a great opportunity for me to know exactly who I am and to know exactly what's in me. And they don't avoid those things. They don't avoid them by running away or putting some makeup on and making <laughs> the situation look all prettier, putting the facade on and, yeah. and walking away. They don't do it that at all. And I feel that quote, which was a quote from James, my brother made um, from the first century of something that I did say, in terms of reminding people that it's that we want to see ourselves as God truly sees us, because if we don't, we can never change. If, if we hold on to this concept that we're already great and without actually looking at whether God feels or, or, or the way God sees us, you know, what blemishes that we have on us, and it's not that God doesn't feel we're great. God knows that our real self-creation, that everything he created was perfect. But we do have this damaged self and we need to be honest about it. If we're not honest about it, we will never get into a state where we'll change it. And if we don't change it, we can never expand and therefore we can never be able to absorb more of God's feelings about us. And, and if we can't do that, then we're never going to absorb more truth and we're never going to become at one with God. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, the next point that we have here mm -hmm. about humility and practice is that... Um, I must be willing to be taught by God. Mm -hmm. So what what does this mean and what are the ways that God is trying to teach us? Well, I've mentioned one of the ways already, this way through the law of attraction, what we attract into our lives, that God has created this law specifically to shine a torch, if you like, upon us as an individual so that we can be a bit self-reflective and go, wow, that's, there's a you know, lot going on in my life. I'm wondering why I'm attracting all of these particular events. And, and eventually we'll come to understand that it's something in our soul that's attracting it. In other words, there's something emotionally, belief system-wise, out of harmony with love inside of myself that attracts an event that is painful coming towards me from the outside world. And so instead of, instead of going, oh, that's their fault and that's their fault and that's his fault and that's her fault and it's your problem, you know, as we often see occurring around the world, what we do instead is we go, uh, my soul obviously has a certain set of conditions that I wish to believe are great, but which God is showing me are not mm. through this law. So, you know, just you, we can sort of choose almost any example. You know, like you could just have no money, for example, in your mm -hmm. life. And, uh, and, and if that's the case, 
um, and you and you're attracting more and more of those kind of events, then there's a, there's a feeling or a belief system inside of your soul that's creating this, particularly when you're in a society that has money available. Mm. You know, so if you're living in a society like a Western society where there's money available um, that, that is quite freely exchanged between people but you don't seem to ever have any, <laughs> then it's quite obvious that there's something going on inside of yourself. Now, you can blame everybody else and blame the government and blame the financial institutions, blame the work situation, blame unemployment, blame all of these other things, and, which a lot of people, of course, do, which is a total lack of humility because your own soul has brought this event to you that you need to work your way through. Now, once you... And I'm not saying that this justifies bad other people treating you badly. I'm just saying that every single event that occurs to you individually is a message from God to you that something's in your soul attracting it. Mm -hmm. And that if you go through the process humbly with God, you'll release that thing in your soul and you won't attract it anymore. That's the basic simple premise that we're presenting. And, and so a person who is truly humble knows that that is way God's, one way God speaks to them, particularly a way God speaks to them when God can't actually transmit a feeling to them. Sure. So, so if God can't transmit a feeling to you individually because you're so closed down and you're so resistive and you're so you know, closed up with your own emotions that you don't want to experience, right? God's got to then try some external methods of bringing to you an openness emotionally and and that is through this law this law of attraction that brings you events based on your condition of your soul mm. can i ask a question then about the law of attraction mm -hmm. um you're saying uh for example in a western society when someone doesn't have money now in the west we're very geared to what we don't have and what we think we should have and all of those kinds of things mm -hmm. but if we look at the way that god might be trying to teach someone in a war-torn country or someone who's living in a lot of poverty, mm -hmm. how is God teaching those people through the law of attraction? Well, every, <clears throat> every single event that the person is attracting is still related to their condition of their soul, right? So, so and also collectively mm -hmm. to the condition of the soul. So we've got to understand that there's individual situations and collective situations, and a person who's humble will see both. Okay. So, for example, a person who is in a Western country who has enough money, would see the poverty of another country and, and do something about it. And if the whole country was in a state of humility, they would never hold on to their funds while another country is starving. Mm. They would never do that. They would give away or bring those people to them, one of the two, so that they both could share with what they had. The problem is that most people in Western countries are not very humble because they want what they want, but they're not willing to share it. And in fact, many Western countries have raped the poorer countries to get those particular things, which is not a humble thing to do either. Mm -hmm. A person who's humble would work with the resources they have in their current location. They wouldn't be go raping other locations to get the resources because they'd be willing to connect to their own emotions about not having those particular resources. Mm -hmm. So if we're in a truly humble and loving state, we're not only seeing our own condition and what it creates individually, but we're seeing also collectively the condition and what it creates. Mm -hmm. And we would also be attempting to address that and do something about that. So on the side of the people who are in poverty in another country, on the Western side, we'd be looking at how, what ways can we actually improve this situation where we can share our resources with these people, not continue to rape them of resources, which is what we've been doing. Right, so we would do that. Mm -hmm. We would also stop individually our own things that we personally do that rapes the resources from those particular countries. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? So we'd actually, well, one of the things that we could, we could stop doing straight away would be stop eating meat. Mm -hmm. That would be a great way because the eating of meat causes the rape of a lot of resources in different countries. So we'd stop doing that. As an emotional, ethical perspective, uh, as a decision that's moral because of the effect it's having on other people. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't go, oh, I've got the right to eat meat, you know, I've got the right to do this, I've got the right to do that. 
because we, because we'd be looking at the effects of everything that we do, and we'd be going, no, these effects are unacceptable. Right? Mm -hmm. Now, on the other end, on the poorer country, the person who's living in the poor country, they'd have to work their way through why they keep attracting this oppression. Mm -hmm. There's got to be emotions within them individually and collectively that causes them to keep attracting this, this oppression from richer countries. And a lot of that, ironically, is the flip side of the same emotion mm -hmm. in many cases. So often it's the flip side of the emotion of greediness. So in other words, one's country is greedy, they, get all, they, they take action, get all the resources of another country, that causes that country to become poor. Now that country feels the lack, right? And then they want to get that back and now they feel antagonistic towards the other country. Now they're willing to engage in even perhaps war or some kind of violence towards the oppressing country. Mm -hmm. Now we've got a kickback. There's a whole set of emotions in there. Why are they willing to engage in war? Why are they willing to engage? You know, do, do you see? Why? Yeah. So, so the poorer countries also have a group of emotions they have to work their way through as well. If we truly want to have a society in the end, that is completely in love, loving with each other. However, the one who is the abuser of the situation first, in this case, in the example I've given the richer country, needs to get into a state of humility, hopefully before the poorer country does, if we're truly going to have any change. However, it's usually the person who does the abusing or the country that does the abusing that is more resistive collectively to getting into a humble state. Mm -hmm. So what this also says is that there are, there are far more arrogant people in Western society mm. and far more lack of humility in Western society than there is in other societies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Otherwise they would never consider raping the other countries mm. of resources. Mm. Mm. Okay. Yeah, it's just that often uh, because of the way we've been brought up I suppose it feels that God tries to teach us in ways that are quite severe which is why I brought up the example we're talking about how God tries to teach us and um, can I point out this about the about humility and the law of attraction sure. it's a combination thing really yeah. because there are very few truly loving people on the earth almost every event that our soul attracts will probably come from an unloving person. And so therefore, it's highly unlikely that the event is going to be a loving event. Mm -hmm. If there were more loving people on the earth, any events that we attracted from those people would always be loving mm -hmm. as a law of attraction to confront our, uh, our unhealed emotion. And so every event would be loving that they create. Mm -hmm. And so we have the, uh, the way God created this law was that we have the ability through this law to learn in a very easy way by all of us engaging love mm -hmm. through this law or in a very hard way by none of us engaging love through this law. And, and it is the personal choice of mankind that determines which direction we've been going. Now, up until this point in time, we have chosen, through our lack of humility, we have chosen to engage this law in a very harsh manner. In other words, one, for example, if I notice an openness in you to be manipulated some way, if I engage the law harshly, I'll be drawn into manipulating you. Mm. If I engage the law lovingly, I'd say, Mary, you've got this openness in you towards being controlled. I'd like to help you heal that without manipulating you. Mm. Can you see the difference? Definitely. Both can help you recover mm. the unloving position that you've been in, or, or the, uh, the, uh, you know, the the unhealed or damaged emotion that you've been in. But one of them is my choice to love, and the other one is my choice to harm. And unfortunately, on the planet, the majority of people do not make the choice to love because they have a lack of humility themselves. And as a result of that, they don't want to feel all of their own emotional condition and they don't want to feel all their own emotional pain. And so then they want to impose their pain upon another mm. and take advantage of the other. 
unfortunately, under those circumstances, it's going to feel like the, the, what I've attracted is harsh. Mm -hmm. But it's only harsh because of the unloving choice of the environment that I'm in. If my environment had made a different choice, then the only, uh, the, I could have had a much loving, more loving event occur, which, uh, which would then trigger the same emotion. And I suppose that's what comes up for me or as you're talking about the fact that God's trying to teach us through this law he's created, mm -hmm. but then the variable is our own will our and own how will. we choose yes. to engage that. And yes. it, it's always going to be in operation with the potential to be loving or not. Exactly. Yeah. And the majority of people, because of their resistance, because of their lack of humility, choose unloving choices. And as a result of that, there can only be unloving events occur mm -hmm. from those unloving choices that then affect other people unlovingly. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, then the world then appears like everything's harsh, but it's only harsh because of our original unloving choice. Mm -hmm. It's only harsh because we've chosen to be hard, so yeah. we've chosen to be harsh. Uh, if we had chosen a different route altogether, then the world would be, we'd all perceive the world to be completely different. We'd all, all go, wow, lovely world this, this to live in, you know. Uh, you know, I've got this unhealed emotion and then someone comes up and they just say the right things to me and, and it's always loving and, oh, and off I go and have a big cry about that and that somebody at last gets me and everything and then all of a sudden it's all healed because I've released the emotion. That could be our path. Yeah. But unfortunately, because of this lack of humility that exists on the planet, it's not the path. Yeah. And, and unfortunately, the lack of humility is what is causing the majority of pain yeah. on the planet. Yeah. yeah. It's not, not even a un misunderstanding of love. It's the lack of humility. Yeah. The reality is if you are humble, you would learn love. Right? But if, if you're not humble, you can't learn love. And so it's not actually a lack of love on the planet that's causing our problems. It's a lack of humility on the planet that's causing our problems. We're never going to learn love while we're so arrogant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So is the, law of the is the law of attraction the only way that God is trying to teach us? No, no. God's also attempting to teach us through other people. Like there are, We are surrounded by spirits uh, who are in a favourable condition with God. In other words, they are at one with God. They want to teach us in a loving manner. We're surrounded by them. They're constantly trying to influence our thoughts and our actions towards love. They're constantly trying to show us what's wrong inside of ourselves that causing the attractions. So we have all of these helpers that surround us constantly that God's given us as a gift. God has also given us the animals and birds and plants and all of those living organisms as a, as a reflection as well so that they are all giving us gifts all of these different things god's created are constantly giving us messages so when god can't communicate with us directly which is not always possible for god when we're so close to god yeah. and so god doesn't want to interfere with our will but god's constantly trying to go influence our will to go we would like to try and connect to yeah. god at some point and and god uses every one of her creations available to her to influence us in the direction where we become open and humble. God's constantly doing that. And so every single thing that God has created other than the human soul, and even other human souls are included, with, um, other than your specific yeah. human soul, uh, has been created specifically for the, uh, to, to attempt, for God, in God's attempt, to encourage your will to yeah. be open enough to begin a relationship with God. Yeah, well, mm. it's a lot of support, hey? Mm. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so what would my emotional state be like when I'm truthfully willing to be taught by God? Well, once you get to that emotional state, then God can actually, through feelings, through a transmission of feelings, tell you directly everything you, you need to know. Right. So once you've worked your way through all of the emotional resistance and all the emotional yeah. reluctance and all of this resistance that is there and present within each person generally towards God and towards their own emotions and, and now there's an openness emotionally, now God can communicate direct, one-on-one -on -one communication from God to you, emotional communication. It's not going to be a voice in your he he head or anything like that. It's going to be a feeling that comes over you that you know is out from outside of yourself and comes from God. And, and those feelings will confirm truth to you or discard error. Mm. You, you'll be able to do both. Mm -hmm. And so once you are truly open to God, you can confirm truth, discard error, confirm truth, without it having...
to even go through the process of any other forms of discovery. But it has to be a burning desire to do it, <laughs> driving it. And it means giving up self-reliance. I totally. Wish, you know. yeah, yeah, totally self-reliant. And also giving up what that looks like to everyone yeah. else. Um, you know, on this planet, we are hugely invested to what it, with what everything looks like to other people. And unfortunately, that causes a huge resistance to God. You know, God's trying to... If you think of it, God's ways are far more perfect than man's ways. As a result of that, God is trying to transmit these perfect ways to man, and man's trying to resist God's mm. perfect ways. And so God's trying to use all of the creation around about the man to help the man come to a position of change. And, and the man, if he, was, if, he, if he was open, he would go through the process of getting all that external help and eventually he would not need any of that external help because mm. now he's in a one-on-one -on -one connection with God. Now he's at one with God. He can, he can work through any issue emotionally now with God and find out every truth. He doesn't need anybody else to help him anymore. He is completely independent of everyone else other than God. Mm. But also in this position with God where God can transmit all truth to him if he has a desire to receive it, if he uses his will to, to receive. And, uh, and that's all it is. Now, as we grow towards God, there's a, whole classify, there's a whole class of things that we don't use our will to understand because we don't know they exist. And so, of course, a part of the process will we'll come to see they exist or potentially exist, and then we'll use our will to understand. And when we're in that place, God will be able to teach us the truth. Mm. But it won't be this big resistance to that process anymore. So once we're at one with God, we still have a whole heap of things we've yet to discover that we didn't even know exist and still don't know exist that we'll have to go through a process of firstly engaging the concept of them potentially existing and then secondly engaging our will to know the truth about them yeah. then god will tell us yeah. but but we won't have all this resistance and anger and rage and addiction and all these other emotions that we had before then because all of those things have been gone yeah mm -hmm. yeah sure mm. so that what you're saying emotionally would be so open if when we're willing to be taught by god yeah. what would our actions look like when we're willing to be taught by god well, our actions right now are always a reflection of our emotions anyway. They're mm. always a reflection of our beliefs and our emotions. So, so if the emotions become more loving and more pure and more perfect and, and all of the un, you know, unlovingness and injured state within us disappears emotionally, then of course every action is a reflection of those emotions. Mm. So, so every action we take is now completely in harmony with truth, completely in harmony with love. We, in fact, we can't even take an action that's out of harmony. Mm. It's impossible for us to even contemplate an action out of harmony. Mm. And you'll get to the point where you don't even think about the action, whether it's in harmony or out of harmony, because all of the reasons inside of yourself for them all being out of harmony have all gone. Mm -hmm. And so there's only reasons inside of you to do things in harmony with love. Mm. And as a result of that, you don't even have to try to work out whether something's loving or not anymore. Mm. you'll just automatically do the loving thing mm. because it's the only thing that's... And in amongst that, there might be literally thousands of potential activities you could engage, but every single one of those potential activities will be loving because mm. you can't engage any other unloving behaviour. What about as though I'm learning, like I'm practising humility, I'm not yet at one with God... Mm -hmm. um, it occur like how would I act in order to um, to live humility? Would I? Well, the reality is you can't fake humility either. No. Right. So so if we are truly living in the damaged self area where we're working, where we're seeing ourselves warts and all, we would also see where we lack of humility. Does that yeah. make sense? We would yeah. also see our lack of humility, and one of the first things that we would do potentially would be to address why. In yeah. other words, our life, until the point of the one with God, would all be about finding every area where we lack humility in our lives and addressing the re emotional reason or belief system inside of ourselves that's out of harmony with the love that causes us to have that feeling, mm. that causes us to have a lack of humility. 
that would be our primary focus in all of our activities, in every single thing we, we do, in every single thing we engage in our lives. We'd be focused only firstly on working through everything that causes us to have a lack of humility. Mm. Once we get into the condition where we've worked through that, we're ironically at the same time growing in love and growing in truth because because every emotion we release that causes our lack of humility automatically unblocks us to truth. Yeah. And therefore, automatic, we're automatically going to receive truth once we've unblocked. It's a bit like... So if we think of each thing as a doorway, so we've got humility being the doorway to truth. If, if I'm now working through humility every single time, so I'm not worried about what is the truth. What I do is I work through my block to the truth, right? So that's what humility does. It causes us to work through our block to truth. That opens me up to any truth. Mm -hmm. Now all the truths that God wants to tell me can all just come to me. Mm. Yes? And, and that means, and then when I'm, because I'm humble, I will, I, will, I will receive them and accept them as truth. Right? And then because I've done that, that opens me to love. Yeah. Right? And God's love will just flow naturally into my soul as a result, and I'll grow, and I'll grow my understanding and my capacity to understand further things grows mm. as a result of my growth. So the way I see it is that this humility is like an opening valve to the truth, and the truth, I don't have to work on receiving truth or discovering truth, I have to work on being humble. Yeah. Right? When I work on being humble, the truth automatically comes. That, that opens me, the truth opens me, to receiving love. When I receive love, my soul transforms. When my soul transforms, now I have a greater capacity to do everything, anything that I wish I have a greater capacity to do. Mm. And I will do it in harmony with the love yeah. automatically. So, so I feel the process of humility in terms of how it looks is more about looking at why I am resistive to being humble. Mm. What, what is... what? What emotions inside of me and belief systems inside of me do I have that cause me to be like a tight ball when it comes to humility and cause me to want to resist and want to be arrogant and want to... Because cause all I have to do to receive truth is to open up my humility. Mm. I don't have to actually go and find the truth. If the truth's just there in my universe around me just waiting to enter me. <laughs> like God's created a universe of truth waiting to enter me, just like God's created a universe based on love that is also waiting to enter me. And if, and if I'm humble, I've got the doorway to all, at all. If I'm not humble, now I'm going to have to work. And now I'm going to have to work on being humble. <laughs> Sure. And that, sure. and that, you know, I don't feel a person can really work on being humble. They can only release the emotional reasons why they're not humble. Mm. And I suppose I was thinking about things where you act in harmony with the truth you already know. Are you you immediately put into practice things that you learn. If, of course, if a humble, humble person would. Yeah. yeah. So, for example, if a person learnt, uh, for example, just very, very basic situation. Let's say a person learnt that they're, that they're, somebody that they know had lied mm -hmm. to somebody else that they know. Mm -hmm. right? Now, a person who's humble would, would not make the choice for all of those people to cover over this whole thing. Mm. Who wouldn't do that? Because a person who's humble would go, I'm, I'm open to my own emotions. I'm open to being attacked by every one of my friends disagreeing with my action. I have some ethics and uh, remember morality mm. and ethics from my humility that's what that allows me to have and so I'd go up and tell the person it's like this is what's happened here yeah now both of them may finish up being upset with you and never want to see you again well that's their lack of humility yeah right because the reality is if I'm truly humble I won't even want a facade I, I will want everything <laughs> yeah. exposed and out in the open yeah. and the beauty of a humble person is that they will act always in this way yeah in every opportunity they have yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So um, how do I, if I'm, we might have already covered this, but how do I approach life in a way that enables God to teach me the most? Well, I, I, feel, I feel I've probably explained yeah, that already. That's um, in the sense that In the sense that the entire universe has been constructed by God to to give all of God's children this opportunity to see the effects of how they utilize their will. Mm. And a truly humble person sees the effects. So he goes, 
wow, I'm living in a country that oppresses other countries. Mm. I am often oppressing other people. I've damaged my own children. I've done this, I've done that. A truly humble person sees what they do and allows this law of attraction that God's created if they can't communicate with God directly to to address these problems mm. automatically mm. and they engage the process with God actively. Yeah, and I suppose inherent in that is not putting ourselves above God or it just ha- we can't um, reach that state without having a total respect for what God has created in order to teach us. Yes. Yeah. There's a lot of people, of course, that are raging about God's laws, mm. um, but that's not a very humble condition, obviously, because yeah. in the end you're just raging against the most loving laws in the universe. Yeah. Um, if you're going to rage against anything, and I don't recommend raging <laughs> against anything because that's an addiction, but if you're going to, surely it would be more wise to rage against the laws that are unloving <laughs> <laughs> rather than ones that are loving. <laughs> yeah. yeah, for sure. Thank you, darling. <laughs> okay, um, the last point on our humility and practice section mm-hmm. is about um, the ability and I suppose the desire to receive both direct and indirect emotional assistance and counsel. Yes, uh, you see this in action a lot when you're dealing with people. You know, some people come up, say, and and you've even had the experience with people who come up to you and said, um, oh, can you give me one bit of advice? And you give them one bit of advice. Usually it's the bit of advice that they least want to hear. And as a result of that, they go, oh, no, I don't want, uh, you know, I don't agree with that. And they walk off, right? <laughs> and, and you've had that happen to you many times, and I've had it ha- happen to it myself many times as well. And that's an indication of their lack of humility. The reality is, even when they asked for it, they still couldn't receive it, yeah. which, which is interesting in itself, yeah. right? But, but even more difficult is when we don't ask for it and we receive it. Mm. Right? And, and the, re- the mark of a truly humble person is a person who doesn't ask for feedback but receives it, but still receives it with humility and love. Yeah. Without addiction, without rage and anger or shame or any other of those emotions. And, and I feel if we're truly going to be humble, we need to learn to have both, actually. To actually, it's great to engage a person and say, can you tell me what's wrong? what you observe that's wrong here so that I can fix it inside of myself. You know, what, what do you notice emo- what, about the emotions I have? And, and a truly humble person will notice those things. They won't necessarily agree, of mm. course, because God may be telling them a different thing. Mm-hmm. And if God's telling them a different thing, they won't agree with the person who's... Yeah. So quite often a person, uh, and I've had many experiences where people have come up and told me all sorts of things about myself that are completely untrue, um, and so, you know, I know they're untrue, but, but I don't have to react angrily yeah. to the person telling them. I say, no, that's not true, and, mm-hmm. you know, obviously don't know me. Mm-hmm. Um, or you're, you know, imposing your own beliefs upon me about what you think upon me. You mm-hmm. think that I am what you are, actually. Um, now, a person who's truly humble is open, firstly, to God, mm-hmm. but also open to all these other forms of information so one for example a person would be totally open to their guides under that their spirit guides under those circumstances so if the spirit guides saying oh you've got a bit of arrogance here and you've got a bit of problem here and you've got a bit of problem there the person would hear them straight away they'd go well yeah i do you know like uh, yeah. what can i do about this you know and have a dialogue with them yeah the person who doesn't want to hear them can't the, the guides are going <laughs> it's like they, they, they whisper you know, and the person yeah. going, what, what? <laughs> because they don't want to hear any information from their guides. Yeah. So a key part of humility is developing a longing for feedback. Yeah. And, and but developing a longing for feedback from loving persons. Mm-hmm. So you can observe in the world around you who appears to act in a more loving way to other people. And then you could go up to such a person and say, look, yeah, I've noticed you're pretty loving with everybody around you. Look, would you like to give me some feedback over you know, time? Because you, know, mm-hmm. you can't just expect it there and then. Um, would you like to give me feedback over time as to what's going on for me? Because like, I, I feel that I'm not as loving as that. Right? Yeah. And so that, that is a wonderful thing you can do for your own self. The second but more difficult thing mm-hmm. is to actually allow people to come up to you and tell you all sorts of things Mm. even in error, and see what your response is. 
you understand? Yeah. So the, the response might be, you know, you might have a bit of anger in you about what they've just said. That's showing you the lack of humility that's on that subject for some reason, mm -hmm. you know. And the reason might not be the reason the person's giving. You know, the person might be coming up and actually attacking you, and then you're angry. Mm -hmm. Well, why are you angry? Because, because you're afraid of attack, and you have addictions about attack. You want people, everyone to love you. You know, that might be one of the addictions. And so when someone comes up and attacks you, you just feel angry with them because they don't love you. Right? A person who's humble wouldn't do that. A person who's humble would still love them, even though they're being attacking. Yeah. Uh, but they would see it as a gift to learn more about themselves. Exactly. Yeah. They would see this as an impromptu gift given by a person who, who doesn't understand love to actually work through an issue, you know, inside of themselves that, that, that would cause them to become more loving. Mm -hmm. and, and so they would see every one of these events, whether they are, you know, what painful or pleasurable, as an opportunity to become more loving themselves and so they'd always embrace the circumstance without attacking the other person, yeah. without resisting the other person. And you're talking about direct counsel there as people verbally saying things, and indirect counsel is perhaps counsel you haven't invited. Mm -hmm. um, is it always verbal or are there other ways we Not receive always. indirect counsel? It, like, the law of attraction works perfectly, so the, all, all law of attraction is really counsel yes. that God's giving us. But also our environment is a reflection as well. If we're very, 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 very sensitive, our environment that we live in, our, our bedroom <laughs> is even a, a great attraction. So if it's very messy, then that tells us some things inside of our soul, about our soul. Yeah. That, you know, if, it, if it's very, um, you know, if it's, if it's very disorganised, that tells us something about our soul. You know, like, yeah. and our house is the same. You know, and our and our environment that we're growing up in is the same. Our our the place where where we live, the location we live, all of it is a reflection of our own condition at some point. What if I'm watching something on telly tonight, and it happens to be you know somebody being attacked in Iraq, mm -hmm. and then I watch something on telly tomorrow night, and it happens to be somebody being attacked in Africa. And then I watch something on telly and the next night it happens. I, I've got to start asking if I'm really humble. I've become, hmm, three attacks, three nights in a row, and I've turned on the telly just to watch them. Something going on for yeah. me here. Maybe it's a feeling where I have this righteous ju justice type of feeling that I need to release or something. But there's something inside of me that I've attracted the knowledge of these events mm. to, to actually address. Mm -hmm. And if I'm really, really humble, oh, I'd be open to addressing those particular issues rather than going, oh, the telly's been pretty bad the last <laughs> three nights. You know, it's just been... I wouldn't do that because yeah. I would see it as a personal attraction, something that my soul is attracted to work through. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and I often look at things like animals, children, even the people I encounter over a number of days, mm -hmm. uh, Phone calls. Phone calls. <laughs> what are the emails. emotions in these people? What's that showing me about me mm -hmm. rather than looking at it just being about them? So that yeah. it seems that, as you said before, that everything that God's created is geared through these beautiful laws to sort of highlight mm. things. It's like God's big highlighter marker, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. yeah. I'm often asked the question, why it appears that there's still a lot of negative things happening around me? Mm -hmm. And my feeling is this. God's refining me through these negative events. There's things inside of my soul that I need to release out of harmony with love that these events are exposing. They got there through no cause of my own, but they're now there. Mm. And these events are exposing them. That's why I have millions of spirits around me attacking me at different times. I have a lot of people attacking me at different times. They're all just exposing specific things that I need to work through. Once I work through them, they will not bother me anymore. They won't have any emotional impact upon me anymore. So I see, all, I see them all as a, as a way for me to rapidly work through the last parts of my emotions to get closer to God. Mm. And I feel that if everybody saw it the same way, they'd be far less attacking, far less resistive, far less um, uh, blocking of, of all of these events they'd be focused primarily on their relationship with God and what this particular event is, is allowing them to work through to get closer to God. Because in the end, if we have, have that viewpoint, 
we will not worry about all these negative events happening. We will see them all as potential gifts, understanding that the world is not in a very loving place. Mm -hmm. There are very few people in the world that are able to give us a positive attraction event, a, an event that's loving, mm -hmm. that will cause us to heal something inside of us. Now, obviously, once the first person gets into it one minute with God, then that person will be able to give loving events to other people. Mm. And once two or three or five or ten do, then those people will be able to share loving events with other people to help them work through their stuff. But the reality is, right at the moment, there is no one at one with God on the planet. So there's a higher likelihood that most of the events that are refining us are going to be unloving, unfortunately. Mm. Now, that's not God's fault. It's just the way that man has chosen to act. Mm. And we need to understand that. And if we can understand that and work our way through it emotionally, we can become amongst the first people to become loving mm. and therefore have a loving effect on the planet with regard to what we give to others. Mm. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. It, it feels to me like um, that hardness that we have around a willingness to be refined is really the sticking point, isn't it? Yeah. Because even in that process you're describing, if we just embrace refinement, mm -hmm. if we call humility, you know, this process of becoming humble as a way of refining us, mm. even our interaction with those unloving things will no longer be painful exactly. over time. Yeah. Exactly. And, and, you know, this is why, like in the Bible, people like Paul use the whole illustration like gold refi being refined by fire. You know, it's not God's intention that our soul was refined by fire in the sense that, you know, that we have negative painful events all the time refining our soul. God's intention was that, that we have loving events refining mm. our soul. But, and once we become at one with God, that's exactly what actually happens. We have just loving events refining our soul and we learn more and more information as a result. But, but the problem is the world is in an unloving condition. There is no one on the planet who is in a, a one minute condition with God. As a result of that, a lot of what we attract are going to be unloving based events to, to help our soul refine. If we're humble, we'll accept that process and go through the process without mm. feeling that it's unfair and the reality is even that it is fair because we have often created a lot of very unloving events for others that they now are going to have to also release uh, through this process. So we need to understand that uh, it's important that all of us understand how linked we are together. And, and just, it just takes one hum, humble person to change things on the planet but, but the reality is it just takes one humble person, uh, lack of humble person or arrogant person to create a lot of pain on the planet. Mm. And we need to understand the relationship between those choices. Mm. And I suppose um, also I see the love inherent in what God has created. He said even when everyone else chooses unlovingness, mm. Um, you're never disempowered. Mm -hmm. You still, my love has created a law that will allow you to grow yeah. even if every single other person around you has chosen not to grow yes you this law will still operate on your soul yes. and you can grow yes and, and I, I feel even more importantly is if we if we understand that that all of the universe is governed by laws of love if i act in, instead of making the choice that's unloving if i act in the choice that's loving all of God's laws support me. Mm. If I act in the cho choices that are unloving, none of God's laws support me. Right? Yeah. And so, and so if, I, if I can see it that way, that if I'm truly humble and I choose to act in a loving manner every single time, then I get the support of God, all of God's laws, all of the people who are also in harmony with God's laws, all will support me sooner or later. Now that's a very powerful, positive direction to take. Mm. If I go down this other track where I, where I take the course of action where none of God's laws support me, every single one of God's laws is working against me. Yeah. <laughs> now, now that already, before you even look at the people, yeah. is, is a bad enough situation. <laughs> all of God's laws are now not supporting me. They're all actually trying to get me to change. They're trying to get me to conform to, to go back to the law-based place and in in addition to that 
everything I create is going to attract unloving events, mm. which will affect myself and other people as well. Mm. So now uh, there's a good chance that while I might have some support, I will also have quite a lot of, of people opposing me. And I don't mean violently opposing me, because God's laws are, are not violent in opposition. Mm. They just work their way they do. <laughs> you know, they're, they're laws, after they're all. Constant. Yeah. They're constant. They're constants. And uh, and um, I feel I feel when you when you're fo- faced with that choice, it's pretty obvious that the humble course of action would be to go into the loving direction, and then to try to w- remove from within yourself every single reason inside of yourself why you, why you can't be humble, mm. why you can't be humble to that direction. Mm. And I feel that's uh, probably where our next discussion will go isn't it as to what are all the reasons why we choose to not go in that direction of humility yeah 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 yeah. and maybe that's a great place to finish for today um yeah so next time we'll talk about the resistance to humility and the ways we resist it yeah thanks darling thank you darling (laughs) and thanks to the guys who are filming today again um lena and vlad over there there's lena (laughs) And uh, Igor's doing the sound over there as well. And two observers. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks, guys. Cheers. Cheers.